Welcome back. I'm Pernilla Berg, your moderator for this last session of today, a keynote dialogue, and while wow, we're in for a treat. What is a cognitive building and what are the benefits of cognitive buildings? That's what we're going to address in this keynote dialogue. And with me to help get that dialogue going, I have partner Lasse Lind from 3XN. And 3XN has as their mission, we design buildings for people to live, learn and work together. So what could be better as an introduction to Lasse Lind? A huge welcome, Lasse. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today to share some thoughts on what cognitive buildings are, uh, in our view, in 3XN and, and GXN. Uh, so just to start off, cognition, the use of conscious mental processes, is really something where, where you could say it's kind of intricately uh, connected to, to, to making buildings. And a kind of a, a credo of our office is really that uh, architecture shapes behavior, and on the other, side, be, uh, other hand, behavior shapes architecture. And this was kind of uh, th this notion of architecture was kind of developed through this project, Ørsted High School, which was kind of a seminal project for us. It's a it's a school uh, education uh, building in, in Copenhagen, and it was uh, it was just designed after the the, um, the creation of a new uh, educational reform, which basically. Uh, kind of changed the notion of what learning is from something that's very sort of uh, based on a classroom setting to something that's much more happening in networks and between the students. So what we basically did was we, we designed a building uh, almost with no classrooms in it, almost as a kind of cityscape with different types of learning settings in order to kind of stimulate uh, learning. So here you see the model. It, it's kind of a, a floor plate that's shifted around an atrium, creating these kind of different plateaus and different types of, of spaces uh, within the building. And, and inside that, you could say a kind of a large staircase that connects the different uh, areas and the different plateaus uh, of this space. But as you see, not a kind of a traditional, uh, let's say, uh, uh, learning environment with hallways and classrooms, but rather kind of an open space with many different types of settings and a high degree of interaction between the, the, the students themselves and, and uh, various forms of kind of informal uh, learning settings. Um, so this... this um, this building, what we did was we, we actually were quite interested in how, will, how does it actually work and how does it actually affect the behavior of the, the people there. And one thing we, we were very interested in was this staircase. So we, we made a PhD, uh, a PhD study on how this staircase actually worked. And what we found out was that as we had hoped, the this, this staircase was actually kind of a generator for, for social interactions between the students, informal meetings, knowledge sharing, but especially the stair landing what was actually where a lot of, you could say, spontaneous meetings, which is often a good way of sort of uh, exchanging knowledge, happened. So, so this was kind of a, a, an insight for us that, that you could say that an architectural element could be some kind of, uh, uh, some, some kind of instigator for a certain type of behavior. And we took that inside and, and kind of transformed it into to other types of building. This is an office building, a commercial building uh, in, in Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, and, and here you can see that we, we've kind of taken this inside around creating spaces around the staircase landing, creating some kind of informal uh, work settings where, where sort of meetings will, will occur. So we, we were quite interested in, in sort of transferring that, that notion of, of, uh, of a kind of a building's a way of sort of affecting behavior into uh, into another typology, in this case, a, a, a office building. So, uh, what the, you could say the some of the um, let's say the science or the, the sort of vocabulary uh, behind this uh, is based on this notion of affordance, uh, the quality or property of an object that defines its, its possible uses and makes it clear how it can and should be used. This is kind of a, a concept that comes from, from social sciences, and this is something we are incredibly interested in understanding in relation to, to design. Uh, because you could say, uh, when you design something, it obviously have a function. In this case, this is a jazz house in, in, in Molde, a city in Norway that we designed. It, it also kind of uh, acts as a, a connection between two levels of the city, but it also becomes an invitation uh, to, to be used as a stage for the yearly jazz festival in, in, uh, in Norway. So the, you could say it affords a certain type of behavior and it becomes sort of a, an object which can be used in many different ways. So we're quite interested in that. 
Uh, here another project, uh, which is a fish market, a new fish market that we are designing in, in Sydney, Australia. And a fish market is obviously a very kind of specific typology, but what we were interested in was to look at how can this huge sort of, uh, you could say, commercial uh, entity in the city become a driver for urbanity and for kind of uh, leisure activities along the, the harbor in Sydney. So you can say that we really look carefully at how does the kind of urban realm and the building blend together and become sort of a, a, a you could say, almost like a, a furniture for, for urban life and for social interactions. So we asked ourselves, what is a fish market today? It's this kind of introvert uh, activity where you see a lot of fish and you're able to buy and eat fish, quite an, a kind of inspirational thing. But, but we, we were very interested in seeing how can we sort of make this much more permeable and much more as a kind of, as a, as, as a thing, as an affordance for, for urban life. And here you see some, uh, some image of that uh, currently underway. So just um, kind of uh, summarizing a bit how we see that in, in terms of, of, of making buildings, we, we begin to find that there are some kind of design elements which, which tend to, to, to work in, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, stimulating these things. So we look at multiple programs, flexible zones, communal transport and various scales. We look at the sort of social comfort and, and trying to break down scale in whatever we do. And we look also at the, the types of business uh, value that this might bring. And, we do a lot of commercial buildings, so we're quite interested in how the, you could say, the work life is changing and how buildings are affecting our ability to work in a good way. Uh, and you could say roughly that we've, we've in, in the sort of office environment, we've, we've moved from sort of a hierarchical, very sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of perimeter office structure uh, across sort of uh, open plan, activity-based work, and into something now where we see it more as kind of neighborhood choice environment. So basically trying to, as designer, offer, uh, offer environments which uh, gives people choices on how they want to work, gives them the, the, the sort of the, uh, the free choice of choosing a sort of a neighborhood uh, and, and different types of work settings. And this is something we, 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 uh, we believe is incredibly important in, in understanding how to design for, let's say, modern, modern work life. So, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about economy. It's always dangerous when you're, when you're an architect, but I'm going to try anyway, because of course a lot of the things uh, surrounding buildings are ultimately about the economy. And you could say, in this case, with work uh, and, and, and sort of commercial buildings, it's, it's really the comfort economy of healthy buildings that, that, that we can discuss. Uh, and what's interesting uh, in, in sort of... Uh, uh, investigating or, or, or sort of thinking about the relation between uh, design of healthy buildings and economy is that it's actually more and more uh, studies and science suggesting that there is a direct link between buildings that are healthy, that has plenty of daylight, that has good views, that has good air quality, and the sort of cognitive functions and therefore the performance of people. And of course, the performance of a workforce is, is by far uh, uh, the kind of biggest uh, economic incentive of, of modern buildings. And of course, this notion that we actually spend uh, up to 90% of our time indoors today, and roughly 50% of that is spent at work, just talks about the fact that this is not just for the sort of uh, the benefit of people to think about uh, healthy cognitive buildings, but also, of course, uh, an economy. And um, um, I'll try to... Oops. Shit. Next here. So... When we look at the economy, it is kind of roughly this way that we often tend to focus a lot on the building cost. This is what we always discussed in, in the build environment, how much will it cost to build. But if you look over kind of a, 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 a lifetime of a building in terms of what the cost is of a commercial building, uh, the, the people cost are actually uh, up to 92% of a kind of building's uh, budget. So, so if you are a commercial building operator, uh, of course, this is, this is really where the money is. And, and again, there is sort of a, there is studies that indicate that there is a kind of 30% swing in performance between the best and worst buildings. So if you know this connection between, let's say, health and economy is, uh, we believe, is incredibly important and interesting. Uh, and again, this is a this is a study done by Gallup in in the UK. Uh, the issue for, for a lot of buildings and for a lot of commercial buildings is basically engagement. How engaged are people in the, the, the activities that they do in a building? And it, this suggests that uh, roughly 11% uh, is what you call actively engaged, but actually up to 21% is what's named actively disengaged, which is quite, quite interesting. So 
I would argue that a building can actually actively engage or disengage people through the way that it presents itself, through the way that it's designed. And what some of the, you could say, the tricks that we always try to employ in order to make people engage and make people feel comfortable at their workspace is a visual connection to nature. Many uh, studies suggest that this is uh, part of lowering heart rate and increased cognitive functions. We, um, we look at a, a kind of variety and diversity of types of spaces, so you're not sort of bound to one working situation, but you can kind of find your space within the buildings. We look at what we call biophilic elements, uh, bringing in elements of natural materials or, or greenery to sort of stimulate, uh, uh, stimulate people. And then finally, we look at, you could say, natural materials that then, uh, on the other hand, also has a kind of low carbon impact. So there also begins to become a link between something that is desirable from a, from a social perspective and something that's desirable from, a, from, a, uh, from an environmental perspective. Uh, this is a project I'll just kind of zoom in on a little bit here at the end. It's this Green Solution House on Bonholm. It's a kind of a living, living demonstratorium for uh, sustainability and, and healthy building principles based on a lot of different uh, kind of solutions uh, for how to, to, to de design for a circular economy and for, for, uh, uh, for sustainability. Uh, and one of the things we were doing was to kind of investigate the relation between uh, daylight and cognitive functions and also, uh, you could say, uh, let's say uh, sustainable technologies and ornament here with uh, skylights as uh, as PVs, photo, uh, photovoltaic cells that produce energy for the building, but on the other hand also becomes this kind of ornament uh, uh, for for the building design. Um, and one of the one of the things we wanted to study, we, this is this is a building that has a, a conference center in it, and it is one of the first buildings I believe to have a day lit uh, conference center. So we wanted to to kind of understand a little bit how how can we then kind of monitor between. Uh, you could say uh, the, the, the feedback we can get from a building for measuring uh, daylight, uh, CO2 levels and other things and, and kind of learn from that. So basically we, we are kind of discussing can buildings somehow through the data we can harvest go from being what you could call a product to more be a, a service or basically something that you go back to and, and sort of interf uh, interfere with and, and redesign in a way in order to uh, achieve these kind of cognitive uh, benefits, uh, well-being benefits. But what we're measuring on there is, is, is CO2, which humidity, daylight, temperature, and acoustics, and, and, and basically uh, creating sort of a feedback loop between the building and data that, that then enables us to learn how, how is the building being used, how, what can we, how can we translate that into, you could say, comfort parameters in terms of understanding uh, uh, the, the, the visitors of this building and the building itself, and then understanding is it actually, uh, you could say, a good idea to have, to have a sort of a daylit uh, conference center, as you see here, how, how does it actually work? Um, so I think the kind of, um, you could say, the, the realm of, 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 of uh, buildings and health and how the built environment affects health is something that's emerging, that's incredibly interesting. Uh, and it's something that we kind of continuously explore. I've brought with me this, this, uh, this little guy, which is, which is one of our newest sort of uh, explorations in, into this field. It's a, it's a small canary bird, uh, and as many will know, uh, the, the story of the canary in the coal mines was that they uh, warned the miners uh, when, when the, the, the gas levels down there became uh, dangerous, or they basically died. This doesn't, this chirps. Uh, but basically, we've kind of translated that, uh, that uh, story into, you could say, a, a modern product. Uh, that basically goes from sort of the miner and the cage uh, with the canary uh, to a family or a learning situation where the canary basically chirps when the CO2 levels are too high, which brings down cognitive functions. So it kind of gently notches uh, uh, the, the user or the, the kids in a school or the user in a home to, to sort of let in more fresh air or to move location in terms of, of getting a more healthy uh, indoor climate. So kind of a, a, a gentle notch. And I, I think for us it was very important that there was this kind of... Uh, uh, you could say, uh, uh, interconnection between design and technology. So we wanted something that was friendly and that had a design quality. So we kind of translated, you could say, this, this notion of a bird in, in, into a, a, uh, a form that then can be sort of hopefully loved by people, so it can kind of fit into to many types of environment here, an office environment, could also be in schools. Uh, and and the, again, there is this kind of feedback loop between the data that you can then uh, uh, see about the indoor climate and the, the potential for the users to actually uh, get an insight, you could say a deeper insight and understanding into how does the building, the building you're in, the workspace you're in, the, the school you're in actually affect 
your, uh, your health and your well-being, and thereby your kind of uh, ability to, uh, to function as a human, basically. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's uh, going back to the Green Solution House, this is an image there. Uh, this is for us a journey that's, that's just starting now, you could, say the, 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 you could say the feedback between what we can learn from data, what we can learn from, from uh, social studies that, uh, that we've done in the, uh, the Ørstad High School and understand how does building actually affect uh, cognition. And I think uh, the next frontier for us is then to see the, uh, the, the relation between what you call uh, sustainable low carbon design here, the, the expansion to the Green Solution House on Bonhomme, which is a fully timber hotel, also designed to kind of, through which you could say natural materials, stimulate the guests, uh, hopefully in a, in a positive way. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so very much, Leslie. That was absolutely fascinating. And I know we'll talk a lot more about that in just a few seconds, you can join me. But before that, we'll hear from uh, Professor Marki, Marco Impadori from Politecnico de Milano. Marco Impadori is also the holder of the Design and Technology Innovation Chair at the Faculty of Building Engineering Architecture. Welcome, Marco. <laughs> So it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, my talk about uh, the sense of cognitive architecture starts from a question, maybe we can take it from the, the Prince Hamlet, to be or not to be. Will we be again in the future? Because the question is not about the planet for climate change, but it's about us. Will we be able to resist to what we create? And what is the sense of our building? Does they still have the same sense, or shall we find new senses? And uh, our, new, our senses can be expanded to understand and to communicate with nature. This is the question, I think. And we should have a different approach, in general, to what we design and to nature, in a cyclical way. Because look, a forest can communicate. If there is a parasite, at kilometers of distance, a forest communicates Trees communicate to trees to protect themselves. Are we able to do the same for our cities and the nature? This is the starting question. But normally I show this slide because from the Buddhist, uh, you know, koshas, we are surrounded by dimensions. And normally I also use this sketch by Friedrich Hundertwasser, which was, you know, very close to the koshas. And, uh, he was saying with the sketch that the first dimension is our skin. Then we have our clothes. The third dimension is the house, the architecture. And then we have the identity around the society and then the earth and the cosmos, the universe. So the number three, what we design, is exactly the frontier from we inside and outside. And in that frontier that plays a critical role, the fact that how we build it and how this skin and these volumes can communicate with us inside and with the nature outside. Being cognitive is something like that. Building is intelligent if we are intelligent in and if we can expand our senses, our natural senses, to detect something more. But now we are creating something like that. We are creating a society which lives indoor and with a polluted environment. And uh, we spend 90% of our time inside these kind of spaces. We, and, and now the, the frontier is detaching us. The bubble is of a house, of architecture, is detaching us from the nature. We should be aware of that because trees communicate again and they understand when this, for example, this beautiful, beautiful fagus understands that the season is changing. So stops to, to nourish the leaves, the leaves change color, and again and again and again in, in a cyclical way. We should be more cyclical. Uh, especially males are not cyclical at all. And this is getting out of the empathy with nature. So cities are like that. This is Milano, beautiful city, impermanent city. So it's not, it's, it's not so empty of trees. But this picture shows like a forest of mineral boxes. And do they communicate? Do they help each other? Not sure about that still, but they could. 
Uh, there is a technology already there. So this is a new building by Mario Cucinella, Active House winner, and it's full of interesting new things coming on. So also skyscraper, also buildings are changing, are getting more you know, empathic and dialoguing with, with the internet we have, the IoT. So now it's very easy to book a flight, to book a train uh, with, a, with a smartphone, and also building can be interacting with this cloud in a positive way. Of course, now we, we are feeling a little bit like this sculpture beautiful from Artesella, alone in a forest, uh, forest of houses, where we are not really understanding what's going on, uh, on around us. But again, let's go back to this scheme. The frontier is really the balance, the energy, between the comfort inside, the microsystem, and the macro system outside. And in that frontier, we should have the equilibrium. And this equilibrium is given via maybe sensors that can communicate with us and with the nature outside. Uh, technology, is it evolving? Yes, I'm very Darwinist about that. Uh, uh, you see cars, this is the car designed by Pinin Farina in the 50s, this Ferrari designed in recent years, or the phones, we can easily see the evolution of artifacts and objects that you use every day. And so are we able also for the houses to, to understand that the change is possible and to understand that we, we can have new functions and these new functions can help us to understand nature and, and to avoid the climate change. Of course, we need to study a lot and go beyond walls. And uh, this is the lab where I work every day, my lab in Milano. Uh, the comfort is one of the first mantra. Uh, he's an active house, the first active house in Italy. And the skins, uh, all the technology is very advanced. Insulation, thermal delay, recyclable materials, uh, steel is all recycled, active surface like we have seen before uh, with active gypsum and zeolitis, nanotechnologies, glazing with high performance. We have everything there. The environment, the building was already built. The name was Attica in 2007. We have recycled it many times and now is an active lab since 10 years. So this year is the 10th year. Energy should be top class and like, like we are able when we choose uh, a tool like this for our house, we choose always for the best performance. So we should do the same for the house. The house is very performing, but in a very easy way, radiating the floor, heating and cooling, air exchange, etc. But how we can control all of this? How can this all be in balance with the nature outside? Okay, this maybe is a bit forced because we can have also augmented reality, virtual reality to see what? To see that the building, which has a, a, a digital twin, uh, is communicating via the sensor in the, the model and giving us back information in our uh, smartphone very easily, like we do in our everyday life. So the sensors are embedded everywhere in the skins. We can control everything. We can see what we cannot see normally. Can we see the air? Can we see the energy? Can we see the PM25 or the PM10? This is not possible, but we can see it thanks to these sensors. And they are straight on in our dashboard. Uh, we co cooperate in some years with Lipcraft, a Danish company, and with, with great pleasure, this uh, marry between Italy, Denmark, Milano, Copenhagen is, is working very well, and we are proud to have this partnership, where you can see things that normally you cannot see. But this is not a sense, these are not sensors for scientists. These are sensors for the users. We need to go to the users and to let them see if they are, building, they are behaving well or not, and how can they improve their way, they, they, their way to live inside of this building. Uh, and doing like this forest, you see all these roots communicate. The forest is not alone. Every tree helps the other trees. When there is, uh, you know, necessity to, and some trees help the other to kill parasites of other trees. So they are symbiotic. And thanks to this network, they are communicating. So, the city should be like that. We have sensors inside and networking of the building and connection with the atmospheric, uh, uh, let's say, forecast to be able to have a kind of forest of housing. Uh, Active House, I mentioned before, is a nice, nice tool for the design phase, for the validation, but for us it's very important in this phase, the operation phase, the cognitive building is here, is really if how we match the radar declared when we design. And here is how we use the energy, how we, use the Im how we impact the environment, day by day, every day. And so this part and the procurement phase is very important for us to understand how can we declare if our house is behaving well. With cars, it's easy. If I drive too fast, there is somebody checking me and give me a <laughs> punishment. <laughs> but if I'm not using well the, car, the house, nobody will tell me nothing. And altogether, we impact uh, 
in a terrible way on the planet. So, of course, we have several tools that are very well known, like, you know, these drones in 2013 were flying over to measure the, the, what is difficult to measure, temperatures of what? Not of the building, of the surrounding, because the so-called heat island is affecting very much the behavior of these boxes. And uh, the fact that we also have to design around the building, not only the building itself. And, for example, after all these analyses, we have changed a couple of years ago the roof. In the, especially in the summer, where in Milano it's very hot, the very high roof the perpendicular was affecting too much those surface. So we have added an extensive uh, green roof also to stop the rainwater. So the building becomes more empathic, because more cyclical. And also all these roofs, they have all sensors to communicate, to give us the real performance every day. Uh, you see all there, and they host uh, uh, a lot of insects, birds, etc. You see, when you enter is, a, is an office, so for us the experiment was not only an empty box. It's the box plus us doing many things, and you know, sensors are everywhere around us, but it's an office with a beautiful light and with people working, and we are a part of the experiment. So we are not here, I think, as a designer to analyze skins and boxes, but to think that we have something that puts in balance the people inside and the environment and the planet outside and the other houses and the other offices. So we should think as a system, I think, of biological system. So somebody calls it biomimicry. You don't need to have everything green to be bi in a biomimicry situation, but to imitate nature using the technology in a clever way. Uh, and to reduce every impact day by day. You see here, the roof uh, with a drone is clearly, you know, the production of energy is PV, and then we have the reduction of energy in the flat part due to the summer sun. And as Nietzsche were saying, we feel so well in nature because it hasn't any opinion about us. Nature can be technically embedded also in the skins, and we can have beautiful butterflies, birds, etc with us, but consider also that this green stops the powders, the PM25, PM10, so it, it is actively uh, uh, an active object. And thanks to that, we can measure with sensor all the behavior, in this case, thermal behavior, or also rain behavior. But I was talking 10 minutes, I have still four <laughs> to go, is all this blah, 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 as Greta was saying, okay? And, because the, the, the risk is there, to talk a lot and uh, everyone has a solution. I don't have any solution. And I'm very much supporting Greta, because I have to put my face there. We should face climate change by putting our face in. And I'm so glad that Lasse before and Trix and GXN, and great architect I respect very much, have designed this airbird. We are using the airbird in the lab and also in schools for children, uh, where we support to let them learn about architecture. And education is very important. Confucius was saying that if your plan is for one year, you plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, you plant trees. But if your plan is for 100 years, you educate children. And I think this is very important. This is this week in a school of architecture for children, some of my guys of the university with the kids telling them that I can see the air. I can see the quality of air. And when the birds start to chip, chip, doing like that, you open the window. Think about that. The COVID, uh, the virus, live very well at 800, 1,000 part per million CO2. We have the monitoring of our lab never rise up more than 600 in the month. So every day you can have day by day. This means that a very oxygenated space kills even what we don't see, because we don't see the air, we don't see the virus. So we have to have clean space and CO2 doesn't smell. So this is the problem. So you don't feel any smell. So when do you feel you have to open the window? You need a sense. You need a simple sense. And in this case, this simple sensor, beautifully designed, helps, I think, new generation and helps us to think differently. To think that we can have these objects around us and embedded in the skins of a building or also in connection with the outside and also being something beautiful. And the fact that now the IoT, the cloud, etc., can use a lot of data, we can use cleverly this data in order to, to use our building to impact less uh, the environment. The calculation in, in the Europe says that 45 to 50 percent of the general impact on energy is due to building. So it's our job. Then transport and industry divide the other percentage. So this is the question, I think. To be or not to be able to design a new way of objects and buildings in order to be empathic and in harmony with nature. And getting to the very end, uh, I think that our smiling architecture should have these very simple uh, keywords. Live comfortably, 
renewable sources to be used, respect the environment and the invisible technology. We don't like to live in machine. Architecture must be beautiful. We have seen before very clear example of, on how architecture can you know, drive the behavior and how ca the behavior can be helped to enhance uh, thanks to the architecture. And so artifacts and nature can really stay together. The balance is just beauty, I think. And the lightness of the beauty brings us to the final sentence that I have used is Italo Calvino's sentence that he was saying, creativity is a place where it rains inside. I hope it will rain a lot inside of the new creativity uh, of the new designers and architects because this is the only way to tackle climate change. And again, planet will stay. The fact that we can be resilient and adapt is only by changing the way we design architecture and objects. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Absolutely beautiful. Please join us, Marco. Now. The bird. You certainly have Airbird in common. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm also tempted to ask from healthy to cognitive to cyclical to empathic buildings. Would you, is this a transition of, of our own uh, humble understanding of what we need to do in order to live within our planetary boundaries? Or is it just acquired wisdom? Um, that's a good question. I, I think uh, that there is probably a movement, let's say, emerging, uh, where there is an understanding that somehow, uh, from an architectural side, what came from the sort of, let's say, modernist movement and, and the modernist understanding of what, what buildings are and should be, uh, a sort of uh, technological, let's say, dominance over nature, uh, where we are maybe, I hope, and I think, believe, we are moving into something where we are, we are searching and trying to understand for how can we sort of reintegrate ourselves into an understanding of the environment. And I think some of the things that Marco spoke to here is, is super interesting. How, how uh, can we somehow, especially the last uh, quote actually, that really kind of moved me in a way because I think I'm thinking a lot about that. How can we in, in a way um, make buildings, and because we're spending so much time in buildings, how can we make buildings a little bit more like being outside, actually, to, or being in the nature, or being in natural environments, which is what is inherently healthy for us, actually. So in, in that way, we sort of spend a lot of time creating a culture of building that is, in, in some ways, very sort of un, unhuman, in a way, and, and, and also kind of... Um, uh, sort of uh, disintegrated ourselves from, from, you could say, natural systems. So, so I think there is a movement now and, and kind of emerging understanding, but of course it's a big paradigm shift that we are probably just mm. in the beginning of, yes. Yeah, but you're totally true. And I had the chance to visit two of your buildings, Bornholm, where I was studying very much tricks and jigs and since a lot of time, very much respect to their work. But I had the chance to visit Bornholm and then also the CIO headquarters in Lausanne that you were showing before. And both of these buildings really show the power of the natural inscape, we can call landscape outside. This inscape of architectural scape is really doing what you say. And the quality of light, the quality of space, the fact that you see other people, that you feel a community. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we feel alone, you mm -hmm. see. A forest is a community. So we should always feel this social effect, uh, uh, feeling to be together. Look, with the lockdown, we were all separated. Okay, technology allowed us to go on. But after that, we need to meet people. We need to stay with people. We cannot stay alone without this contact. Yeah, it was also one of the things that was I found hugely inspiring from your presentation, Marco. The, the, I was wondering, should buildings become more simple and us better at understanding the building? Or should the building have embedded these various sensors and technological devices that we can then become better at applying? Well, I think that simplicity is a good question mm. because the simplicity always, you know, sometimes simplicity hides a complexity to get to that simple <laughs> uh, result. But uh, all this technology is not nothing new. We have in our cars, for example, our cars is full of sensors that we don't see. Mm. Uh, we don't see why it does a beep beep when we have to fix the belt, mm. but there is a sensor under my button, or when the, the engine needs to be controlled. So all these sensors are around our life and they extend our power to understand. So as far as they are embedded in a house, they are not 
or uh, you know overcharging the house i like them mm. when the house becomes a, a spaceship or a machine i don't like it mm. <laughs> there is a, an interesting book uh, called behaviorology by atelier bauhau mm. in in japan and their research is very much also differently uh, touching what you, the research of lasse and his team is doing because to work on the behavior of people around is such important. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and I know also that we have research documenting that the users actually find sometimes the devices difficult to read. I love the picture of your dashboard. Uh, you were able to completely decipher what every uh, abbreviation meant. Mm -hmm. A lot of users would not. So one of the questions from our audience is how can, uh, how difficult is it for architects to involve the users in tech for everyday life? Mm -hmm. I think the car is an excellent example, but how do we do it when it comes to architecture? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and I also very much enjoyed the, the dashboard and I think it is actually kind of a key uh, thing in terms of, you could say, the you could call the business model of architects and of architecture because we are very much in a paradigm where we design an object, we, we deliver that object, and then we are done. <laughs> and actually, um, then the interesting things start happening because then people start using the buildings and they, they, they do what they do and, 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 and all kinds of things that it's very hard to predict as a designer uh, emerges. Mm -hmm. So I think, they, and I hope there will be sort of a, a change towards understanding buildings much more as a product that I said, and, and, and this I think is a good reference mm -hmm. maybe to a car and to other products to say, well, it's actually, uh, oh sorry, a service, that's what I meant, but um, that being in a building and being healthy in a building and thriving in a building is, is, is in a way a service that that designer, that building provides. And I think there is a link, uh, there needs to be a link between the design and the insights from, from what you can actually say about behaviors and buildings and what you can learn from that. And I think technology is, is one way of, of, of gaining that insight. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we are yeah. both trying to do from different angles, trying to get that insight so that we can basically become better designers. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But for example, I tell you uh, for the audience and interesting things about my lab. In my lab works architects, engineers. Well, we need to teach them, mm -hmm. even if they are theoretically very skilled. Uh, anyway, I, t I make Always also this example for them. The, uh, my lab is like a small boat that goes with the wind. When you go with the wind, if the wind is against you, you don't open the spinnaker, okay? Because that's not, not intelligent. So mm -hmm. if our building is very well insulated and we have glazing to the south and the sun is strong there, I need to hide the blinds. And if it doesn't make it automatically, I make it in one second. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand that where they live, they just have a, a second to dedicate to a couple of things to adjust the function of this nearly zero energy mm. building or whatever you can call them. Yeah. We have a question, uh, and thank you very much for the question. Uh, it goes as this. How has architecture become less empathic during the last decade? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. It is a tough one. Uh, I don't know if I'm the right one to answer that, but and I'm not sure it has, but uh, it's maybe a very big discussion to go into, but, but you could say that maybe architecture and, and, and cities have been tied up uh, very much into economy mm. and a global economy, and uh, that is uh, sometimes uh, problematic. I think yes. I will leave yes, it. Yes, I, <laughs> I think that architects uh, were very much concentrated on the ego instead of the eco. Mm. And the wow effect of a lot of architecture, which was very much paid by the finance, by the cities to have this wow effect. Mm. We can call it also the Bilbao effect. Let's, mm. let's take Gary as an example, mm. beautiful building. But after that, many were following mm. that kind of strategy. Mm. And without thinking about costs, without thinking about ecology, mm. without thinking about anything, now we are in a different phase. Yeah. So I think that this will help uh, uh, good architects to react in a good way and propose new solutions. Mm. And we will have a new era. We will go beyond, even beyond the modern movement. Come on, it's long ago, the modern movement. Yeah. Very well to study, but I have a kind of crack in the rear mirror. I cannot look so ba back. I know the, the, the path I've done. We have to look forward. No, I agree. I, I think it's, it, it's interesting what you're saying. I, I think that there is a sort of, there has been a, a, probably a period in, in architecture where it has been very much a kind of, the iconicity has been very much, how does yeah. it look? And is it exactly. sort of, you could also call it a kind of masculine <laughs> uh, iconicity if you want it. Yeah. And I think probably the time now is, is to understand uh, iconicity as something much more holistic mm. and much more something that, that needs to perform on many different levels. It's not just enough that it looks in a certain way or has a cer certain kind of technological advanced state. Mm. It needs to 
be empathic to people and it needs to uh, sort of uh, think about the environment and needs to do um, do many things. So in that way, I think it is, I hope and I think it is changing. Mm, yeah. I believe it is. Yeah. There is an uh, Icelandic professor at uh, Aalborg University, mm -hmm. Harper Pikjastotia, and she's also looked to Greta Thunberg and, and mm -hmm. the planetary boundaries, etc. And she says that one of the things we may have to face is that we're entering the era of frugality. Not also. the era of why. Also. Wow. Also, you're right. Mm. You're right. Uh, so we have a question which is leading into this. How can we make architecture more cyclical? And I think it's your metaphor with the trees yes, and the yes, forest yes, yes, that yes, is spurring yes. this question. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful question, mm. a great question. I think uh, from my perspective, uh, something that, that we, we think a lot about in our design is how, how is it adaptable? How do we build in a way so that it can adapt to, to changing exactly. functions and to changing needs so that the, the, what we deliver in a building is not too fixed in a way. In London, they say long life, lose fit, and I li like that a lot. Uh, you actually get a kind of a longer life out of making something that is a little bit more loosely fit because then can be fitted by the by the user. So for us, that's incredibly important. And it goes all the way down to how you actually put things together. Mm. What kind of principles do you use when you're putting two materials together? Is that reversible or not? So, so that's a, a big point for us at least. Yes, I have a yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes, for me, I think the cyclicity, for example, I was mentioning. First of all, is how the building behaves. Mm. The way I, I the building behaves in the winter mm -hmm. is different than in a summer and in a temperate situation. So the the adaptability of the skins and the openings to be you know, uh, cyclical, like the nature. The nature is cyclical, so winter is cold, mm. uh, warm in the middle season, hot in the hot season, so the building behaves in a cyclical way. And the other thing is materials. Materials coming from cycles, going back to reuse, reduce, recycle, etc. So we need to think about that since the beginning. Uh, you were mentioning before, the architecture before was uh, iconic and static. Mm -hmm. mm. Exactly. Always the same, for a picture on a magazine. <laughs> that, that is the risk. We have a lovely question for both of you. Which three cognitive functions would you build into your own home first? I think I would. <laughs> it's a, I think it's a well, the, the first cognitive function, I think, is really the quality of air. Mm -hmm. When you are inside, the quality of air, the, this kind of communication, what am, am I breathing? In the room of my child, of my children. So what are they breathing? Because sometimes they have a lot of toys, artifacts, etc. If they have a lot of VOC, that's not good to live in. So the quality of air, cognitivity first, I think. Uh, then the second thing is uh, um, uh, the fact that the building can predict uh, even what's happening in the future. So with some sensor, will it be two weeks rainy day? Okay, uh, uh, rainy, uh, rainy days, and I have a flat roof. I can store the water there. Uh, instead of having a bomb uh, in, in, the, in, in the sewage system. For example, these kind of cog cognitions, I think, is interesting to avoid uh, that our artifacts create disasters. And, and of course, behavior comfort inside. Mm -hmm. You have a you can you can have a third if you I want. I can have a third. Yeah, okay. you can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, of course, I would la la love to have a third. And the third, uh, I think, is uh, uh, the the fact that. Uh, the building can tell me directly on a, easily a smartphone, so everyone can use, not an engineer, uh, how are we spending our money? Because we don't know, we use the energy and at the end we pay and we don't really understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, with a cognitivity like that, we could be driven in a better way to you know, lose less energy and have Air, comfort. weather forecasting yes, and, and energy, energy consumption. Yes. Mm -hmm. Less? <laughs> Oh, those are all uh, very <laughs> nice. So I, I could, uh, I could, um, but I think uh, maybe I will uh, go go a bit uh, a different way, just just for fun. And I think uh, I would, um, I would uh, design my home, uh, and I am trying to design my home where I live, so that it it, it invites. Uh, uh, you could say connectivity in my family, <laughs> so that we are. It invites us being together, and that there's good spaces for being together. And this is very banal in a way, but this is also uh, maybe the most important function of a home that you can yeah. uh, be together in a good way. Uh, I think so we I think also learned that during the pandemic, didn't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have a question from: uh, Do you also design for electric light to complement daylight, or do you leave that part to other parties? 
you, you, sorry, uh, el electrical you, light, yeah. artificial light, and yeah. daylight. Do yeah. you design that uh, to to complement daylight? Complement or is uh, somebody else? We, well, uh, we are not lighting designers as such, but we are involved in that process as well of of, of choosing what mm. kind of electric light we have. But we are trying to basically minimize it mm. uh, as much as we can. Uh, but of course, uh, yes, uh, we are involved with that. In, in the lab, in the lab, we, we have this. I cannot mention the company, an Italian company. The lighting has been designed uh, is dimmerable, so any time, of course, mm. it's a small building, but for a huge building, you can really understand when you start to put the light on, it doesn't start in full power, but in a, a midi, mi, uh, let's say, uh, average power mm. uh, comparable mm. to the light, natural light. And this will save a lot of money mm. through all the year. Mm. Also, this is interesting. It is, it is. We and it's also uh, very much linked to how you experience a building and how you behave in a building. Yeah. So in that way, light is incredibly important, yeah. We have a, a question to, to set us off into the future here on a finishing note. Maybe architecture has, uh, has been efficient and now we need to create more for less. We need to create more for less for more, hmm. uh, for Halalat approach. In 25 years, what will be our view, I have to say, what will be our view regarding our home in 2050? That is a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very good I, question. I think uh, the, the view from our home will on, on one hand be what it always has. It needs to provide us security and, and, and joy. And on the other hand, I think and we will expect documented health. We will not accept unhealthy materials, unhealthy chemicals, unhealthy uh, living environments, and, and, and we shouldn't. So I think that that will be, we know so much more now about what is actually healthy for our bodies uh, than, than, uh, than we have before in terms of the built environment. So I, I believe that will, mm. that will be uh, significant. Yeah. Yes, well, the, the vision every day when I teach to my students, uh, I see their vision very interesting because the future is their future. Mm -hmm. So in 2050, will I be ever here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I will be too old anyway. And I think their vision are interesting. And another thing very interesting is about uh, living on the water. I think uh, water is rising and to have architecture on the water is something that we should think. Uh, is, is a vision possible in many of our old cities, like, like Copenhagen, you have a lot of docks that in the past had a lot of ships, now no more ships, but you can have new boroughs going on, something is already going on, I think it's a chance that we should exploit. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Beautiful visions for the future. Lesa and Marco, thank you for joining me. It has been an absolute pleasure. And on that note, we are beginning to say goodbye for today. It has been a formidable journey into health, cognitive buildings. We finished off on an empathic note. I hope that you will join us tomorrow where we start off the theme for tomorrow, innovation, technology, flexibility. And we start at 9 a.m. with a keynote from Tina Main from Velux Innovation. Thank you very much for today.